From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 121, recorded on November 15th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Despommiers. Hello there, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. <laughs> What's the weather like out there? It's miserable, actually. This morning it was raining and blustery. It, it looks like it's clearing, though, west of here. Oh, yeah, I can see some sky there. Yeah. You know, so miserable. I got stuck on the A train for over an hour this morning. Oh my and I got off the A train just thinking, oh, what a horrible experience. And I came out into this weather. I was like, I'm getting back on the A train. <laughs> it's not as bad compared to this. Uh, you take the train from Long Island? Took the train into Penn Station yeah. and then the, the subway. So, how long is the train to Penn Station? It's only about 35 minutes. Well, that's bad. That's not bad at all. So, that is very easy. And Are then, you in the South Shore? Uh, I'm up North Shore, Port Washington. Oh. We have a great train. It's 35 minutes express train and to then 35 Penn Station. minutes the A train. Uh, sometimes an hour and a half, like this morning. <laughs> That's what killed me. <laughs> I used to take the train from New Jersey, and um, the, the problem was the train was an hour from Rahway. Mm. It took too long. So your commute can be an hour and a half, two hours. If it's hour and a half, two hours, yeah, a lot of times. <laughs> wow. So I try to I try to work, and I actually got a lot of work done this morning. You can listen to podcasts. Um, yeah, there's some really good podcasts. Talking. Have you ever <laughs> so even, I've heard? Have you ever even listened to a podcast? Sure. You don't listen to hours. I know that. Oh no, but I've listened to Spotify. <laughs> of course, I've listened. Yeah, to how hours. do you listen to a podcast? Of course, I. Have. Where do you go to listen to it? I do it on my my uh, computer at home. Your computer? My computer. My Apple computer. Dixon said, "I don't understand him." Previously, it's true. That's because well, I speak French. <laughs> no, you're you're, right. you're in another era. You're like. Uh, <laughs> Back to the Future, that guy with the white hair, fuzzy. You think I'm like that yeah, guy? Yeah, that guy, yeah. I wish I knew as much as he did. He was pretty I, good, I actually. do, too. I wish you knew as much. As he did. <laughs> You're pretty good with parasites, I have to say. Oh, thanks very much, Vincent. I'm we not so bad a, with trout fishing, either, as we you're going to find out. We have a question about a fish parasite today. I'm hoping you can answer it. I will pay. I know you haven't looked at it ahead of time, because you never prepare. Ooh. You know, if you if you prepare too much, it's like you're sort of well, yeah, you know, compensation for time. I, mean, yeah. be, I won't be yeah. jazzed up for this time. I yeah. want to be jazzed up. Is that up your excuse? It. It's not an excuse. Not Actually, excuse. I think he did prepare ahead of time. That's why he was snoring before. <laughs> Don't you remember <laughs> that I tried to download <laughs> these and I couldn't get them on my computer, so you had to help me. All right. So shall we get back to our case? Let's case try that. From TWIP120. All right. As I like to say, for everyone um, who's tuning back in and for all those who are tuning in for the first time, we presented last um, episode the case of a 48-year-old man from Mali, Africa. He was from a town, Bamako, which is down in the southwestern portion of the country. Um, he was born in Mali, but he's coming in to see us in the hospital here in Washington Heights in New York City with profuse watery diarrhea. Okay. Mm -hmm. He'd been in the U.S. since he was 18, right? 30 years in the United States, working in the United States as a long haul truck driver for these 30 years, but he frequently visits Mali. And he had recently been back to Mali to unfortunately attend his father's funeral. Uh, he developed symptoms about a, one week after his return. He'd been there for three weeks in Mali. And he is um, reporting three liters or more of diarrhea per day. And I think, as I was saying, it was so much diarrhea that his place had just gotten to be unlivable. And that was what prompted him to come in. Um, he didn't report any past medical or surgical problems. He said he hadn't seen a doctor in a really long time, no allergies. Um, we weren't able to, to find out from him what his father died of. Uh, apparently, he didn't even know, but his mother is living back in Mali and is okay. He doesn't take any medications. He, doesn't re he reports some alcohol and some marijuana use. <laughs> um, and then 
This got Vincent very excited. He reported exposure to professional female sex workers. I can get excited. I'm curious. <laughs> okay. Please. <laughs> well, I can think of is infectious diseases. Okay. You told me there's no protection involved here. Whoa. Yes, no protection, no condoms. Whoa. Uh, and when he was initially seen, he was um, febrile, temperature of 39 Celsius, well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit for those of you stuck in Fahrenheit. Blood pressure was low at 80 over 40, heart rate 110. He's um, breathing rapidly in the high 20s. Um, he's cachectic. He looks wasted, um, incredibly thin. You can count his ribs. And then he's got this fungating lesion in the perianal area. It's really macerated, um, um, not aesthetically pleasing lesion. Um, and I let everybody know that he underwent HIV testing, which was positive. We later learn that this is clade B, which is of interest, and then his T cells are below 100. Actually, well below 100, but. Wow. Clade B, for example, for, for, by the way, predominates in the Americas, Western Europe, and Australasia. Got it. Do you know that country named Australasia, Dixon? Yeah, it's a very large country. <laughs> 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 All right, we had a number of guesses, even though it's only been a week since our last recording. Right. Were you here, Dixon? Yeah. All right, Shelby writes, hello from Nashville. I was back. Currently, it's sunny and 16 Celsius. My guest diagnosis for the long-haul trucker is cryptosporidiosis caused by cryptosporidium parvum mm -hmm. or C. hominis, which can cause the massive fluid loss reported. Right. The patient most likely ingested oocytes from fecally contaminated food or water. Just finished my registration for the next semester at MTSU, and I'm very excited to say that I've enrolled in a parasitology course. Looking forward to using the podcast as a resource and inspiration for my studies. Have a that's great a, day. That's in Bozeman, Montana, by the way. Montana I think, State. I, I think it's Middle Tennessee State University. <laughs> from no, I, I she is from right. Nashville. I was going <laughs> to so. say Montana State University, but yeah. no, that's no, what I'm thinking. Yeah, You're right, Dixon. Yeah. It's, it's Middle Tennessee. Middle yeah. Tennessee yeah. State University, because she's from Nashville, so I, I don't think that's Montana. Isn't that in Murfreesboro? Oh, I I. Do not know. Yeah. And by the way, the um, the town that the patient is from is pronounced Bamako. Bamako. How and did I how did I, how did I Bamako. pronounce it? You Bamako. said Bamako. Did and I? It's, and it's the capital, <laughs> the capital city of uh, Mali. Jackson, are you able to read the next email? I could happily do so. Brian writes, uh, hello to, to Panasome Docs. After the last paper, I couldn't help myself to try that one out. <clears throat> First off, I must apologize for my last letter. I must confess that I was a bit embarrassed at how poorly written it was. <laughs> I am still at work, still on my smartphone, but I have at least stopped long enough to write this email. I think the 48-year-old male from Mali suffers from cryptosporidiosis. I had a quick search online, and there's a paper, a little dated, from 1997 that I found on Google Scholar that references enterocytozoan benuzi, Bernoulli. also, I think this is a parasitic fungal species, but another study showed higher percentages of C. parvum, that's cryptosporidium parvum, in this region among patients with HIV slash AIDS. Thank you for suffering through my last guess, and I hope that autocorrect did not run my fingers this time. Thank you for the shows. I love them all, and I always look forward to the next ones. I didn't get into the description of my guest because you have already provided pathology and usually... <laughs> Give a good brief description of the lesion after the, where, the reveal. Where, where are you getting this from? So I'll let others Wait. ramble on about such things. Thanks again. Hope I'm right. Thank he, you, Brian. He edits the letters. I do. I do. I, he I, does, I, I, I add a few ins and outs. Can I Maybe he should you, preamble. Brian, this I hope is, you didn't this mind. This is roughly an email. <laughs> Dixon. No, um, no, no. He was apologizing for it. No, it was, do you need new glasses, Dixon? No, I'm, I'm fine. Away. Can you see the letter? How many fingers do I have up, Dixon? <laughs> Nixon. <laughs> All right. How so many shall I, I shall I read the next Vincent? one while you guys? One. Uh, <laughs> no, two. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yes, Daniel, please. Okay. Yosef writes. No, and I should comment. You know, my kids all mispronounce everything also. And I think what it I, I think what it is, it could be genetic. It could the be. other might be when you read things instead of hearing things yeah, verbally. It's, it's you know, so sometimes they come up with these words. They're great words, but oh, they're very entertaining. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Nope. Like you, you acquired that from reading. The only reason I know that that's how you pronounce it is because Bob Gwads, who's a friend of mine and he's been on this show, has actually worked there. 
So we used to talk about going to Bamako all the time. Okay. And this is uh, Yosef. Dear TWIP team, it is ironic that you asked me to make sure that my classmates had access to the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases since I have already handed it out. Nice. The second year medical students recently had their parasite lecture. It's just one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> one so, Arg. Arg. <laughs> I guess they crammed it in there. So I right? put up the PDF of the textbook on Facebook. Nice idea. So that anyone that was interested could look up more information. I made a selling point that all the pictures were in color. Right. <laughs> on behalf of the medical school, I do thank you for the free access. Nice. As for the differential for our patient, my number one diagnosis would be a cryptosporidium infection. Mm -hmm. While cryptosporidium can be well-managed or even asymptomatic in an immunocompetent patient, an immunocompromised, in immunocompromised patients, it can lead to severe diarrhea and has a high mortality rate. In this patient, he may be severely dehydrated by the vast amounts of fluid that have been lost, leading to the activation of the sympathetic system in order to compensate. Mm. His BP, being 80 over 40, is particularly concerning. I would put in two large bore IVs immediately <laughs> and give two liters of NS or LR, that's normal saline or lactated ringers, before doing anything else. Um, I'll throw a little aside. Uh, Yosef, you should look at the literature. We always say that internists give normal saline and surgeons give lactated ringers. This is actually the one time when the surgeons are doing the right thing because the literature supports the lactated <laughs> ringers, which... <laughs> anyway, so go with the LR. Next, I would get a CBC to see if there are any electrolyte abnormalities from the severe diarrhea and try to replete accordingly. A diagnosis could be obtained via stool culture or PCR immunoassays if they are available. I would also want to check for any other infections that may also be present, particularly pneumocystis gyrovecchi, MAI, or tuberculosis, since the patient is breathing fairly rapidly, and I don't know what his breath sounds are like. Hmm. Treatment for cryptosporidium for this patient would require the initiation of heart therapy, highly active antiretroviral therapy, so that his own immune system would start to fight back. While nitazoxanide and paromamycin seem to help immunocompetent patients, it does not offer much benefit to immunocompromised patients. If I may pose a question to Dr. Griffin, what is the chance of developing immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome in this patient? Uh -huh. If we find another infection, should we treat it first and then reinstate heart therapy? Basically, I'm trying to find out if iris is worse than having the diarrhea or the other way around. Sincerely, Yosef Davidoff, Hofstra School Medicine Class of 2018. P.S., in the case, it was mentioned that the patient had around three liters of diarrhea a day. In the textbook, it says that immunocompromised patients may get over three liters of diarrhea per day. Coincidence? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I wonder who wrote that textbook I anyway. Wonder, exactly. <laughs> so just being immunocompromised give you diarrhea or the, the infections associated with that? So I, I think as we'll, well, as we'll discuss, because these people seem to be getting the right diagnosis, um, Immunocompetent people often are asymptomatic or have mild diarrhea, but the immunocompromised patients nice. will have this voluminous diarrhea. And uh, I actually, because I'm a nice guy, I uh -huh. knowing that in our textbook we say we say three liters, yeah, so I he, threw in I threw it in as just a little bit more of a, who reads. a reward wow. for people who read our textbook. Very Bingo. good. Um, but. Maybe I should, should we discuss the iris question? Do you think yeah. our readers? So, yeah, you should. Yeah. So this, is an, this is an issue. And it actually, we, we, we've we learned a lot about it now with um, HIV and the fact that we can yeah. bring back the immune system with these incredible medications. But this whole um, process was originally described actually in the mycobacterial infections. Mm -hmm. You would start to treat someone for tuberculosis who was just severely ill and overwhelmed by the infection. And then as you killed the bacteria and their immune system came back, you'd see this just massive inflammatory response. Right. Um, so a number of the infections in HIV patients, we actually have to be careful. We'll wait a little before we um, start bringing the immune system back. Let's say they have a um, cryptococcal infection in a, in a closed space, like inside the brain, inside the skull. If you were to bring back the immune system at the same time that you were treating that fungus in the brain, um, you can have a high mortality rate. Um, so there, there's this timing issue that as the immune system comes back, um, sometimes we're actually using steroids 
to mm. calm it wow. down. Yeah. So we're we're getting rid of the virus. We're calming and slowing the reconstitution of the immune system. Um, in this case, we're counting on it. Um, none of our medicines are particularly great for this particular pathogen. So we want mm-hmm. we want the immune system to come back. And it, it's not a closed space, right? It's the um, it's the intestines. So um, you know, inflammation away. Interesting enough, let's say you thought about typhoid, right? Where you actually get this massive inflammation in the intestine in the pyrus patches. That's a situation, right, where we actually end up with holes because the immune system is so robust. You end up with perforations. Wow. Um, so. Just the opposite of what you'd expect from something that, you know, is a terrible condition to begin with. I remember when I first heard about this, I couldn't believe that that was actually happening. And, you know, you, <laughs> you have to give steroids to calm down the immune system after you've reconstituted it because now it's too and it's yeah it's a very it's a very it's, a very, it's, very, tricky important, it's very important to know about we had a case about a year ago where a patient almost ended up in the intensive care unit as i'm sort of prodding the medical students and the wow. you know the early interns like wow are you thinking about this do you want to you know and yeah you know finally got to the point where he's like let's give them the steroids and next day the person was just looking great and then we were able to slowly Amazing. over a period of weeks <laughs> Um, bring the bring the steroids yeah. down, right? Um, yeah. So uh, MAI is Mycobacterium avium, intracellular yeah. MAI. Okay. Now a large, or we or, would say MAC. We would often say Mycobacterium avium intracellular complex now because we're MAC, yeah, yeah. yeah putting on and the Pneumocystis juravecki was what we used to call PCP. PCP, yeah, they renamed it. Mm-hmm. I kind of liked PCP. I used to like it because we used to think it was what a parasite. Now it's <laughs> they it was now parasite. they know we know fungus. it's a fungus. Yeah. So I hate to lose that from our. Yeah, I do too. But otherwise, I would. Just it's gone. Just, just, <laughs> <laughs> I have to ignore it. Carina, <laughs> uh, and large bore IV to get the maximum flow of fluid. Yeah, yeah. The um, the IVs. If you use small IVs, you can only get fluids going in at a certain rate, and it may not be fast enough in a person who is um, as dehydrated. Um, and septic, I'll say, as this gentleman was. Right. How many how many sizes do IV needles come in? Two, large and small. <laughs> no, many actually. Many? Um, the ones that we use on a regular basis, um, the large bore in this case would often be a sixteen gauge, and then eighteen, cool. twenty, twenty two, and then smaller. You know, as the number goes up, the actual size goes down. Right. Um, but 16 would be, you know, two 16 gauge needles would be perfect. Sometimes we'll use 12 gauge needles. When we'll mm-hmm. do intraosseous infusion. We'll actually take a large, put it right into the bone mm. when you're having trouble, particularly a child's getting access. And then the fluids we actually give through the bone. Wow. Good. Now, when you write this prescription do you, or the order, do you specify the bore of the IV? Or we, you, most of the time you don't. Um, no, no. In this case, you would. In this case, but in if the, it were antibiotics or just saline, you know, after surgery or something, would you do that? We wouldn't necessarily specify this. Yeah. You'd leave it up to the nursing staff exactly. to figure it out, right? No, no. Hmm. Next time Dixon's in the hospital, give him the wrong size. <laughs> you're, you're in a tear this afternoon, Vincent. I don't no, know. no, I'm fine. I'm <laughs> We're okay. going to have to duke this out. He okay. looks very sick, Dixon. Maybe you need to get some IV. I look sick. Your eyes are watery. Aren't his eyes watery? I actually thought he was looking good today. He was looking thanks, good. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> well, you got a friend. <laughs> let's, let's find out who the physician is here first. Okay. Now, Frederick writes. Daniel, Vincent. Daniel's the physician. <laughs> Frederick writes, hello, getting a blooded tooth, Swedish expression for acquiring a craving after having a first taste of something from last week's contribution. I will venture another guess. First of all, his HIV subtype, of course, suggests that he contracted the virus in the U.S. rather than Africa, which is reasonable to assume from his history. U.S. could be Americas, could be Western Europe. Right? That's true, but Australia, but as we talked yeah. about um, in in Mali, it's traditionally the clade C. Yeah, he didn't get except in Mali. for there's the border area uh-huh. where all the terrorists are from, and so that was Chad, something I I remember Chad? I remember raising that with my team. You know, do do they know that Algeria is up on the and in Algeria you might see clay you might see clade B. So he says he's from. Bamako, is that how you pronounce Bamako. it? Bamako, yep. Um, but that, that's interesting. That's an interesting yeah. sort of story of where do we think he acquired HIV? How long do we think he had it? Right. It would be reasonable to think that he contracted the parasite in Mali, though, via contaminated food, e.g. the state of his anal cancer indicates that he is not particularly prone to seeking medical advice, you would think. Tracking his sexual contacts will probably be an arduous process, given his occupation and hardly recent infection. Obviously, there are several parasites 
that could cause diarrhea in a severely immunocompromised patient. I'm going to go with the classics, however, and guess cryptosporidium, which could cause this clinical manifestation with profuse, I'm assuming, secretory diarrhea. No colitis symptoms, blood and pain mainly. When it comes to diagnosis, stool would provide it. In our lab, you would have to ask specifically, though. I think it may be a PCR test. I'm guessing O&P might be challenging with the volumes of sample matter. But to test for co-infections of both you and prokaryotic kind would be as wise as they may contribute to symptoms and may be possible to treat etiologically. If the diagnosis is correct, his diarrhea may be severe and prolonged. This is an intensive care patient showing signs of hypovolemic shock so prompt volume expansion is indicated before anything else with your preferred crystalloid. <laughs> Once he is in the hands of the ICU docs, I would concentrate on getting him on an appropriate antiretroviral regimen as getting his CD4 count up over 200 is what could possibly save him in the long run, as the pathogen itself is virtually untreatable but self-limiting in a competent host. Frederick, pediatrician in training at University Hospital of Northern Sweden in Umea. Good answer. It's interesting. Very good answer. I I wanted to go back to the letter before that, um, or even before that, where someone suggested doing a stool culture. A stool culture for cryptosporium is... Impossible. It it doesn't grow in culture, so you wouldn't find it that way. You have to concentrate it somehow. Hmm. So Zachary writes, Dear Twip Tramverit, <clears throat> My name is Zach, and I am a second-year medical student at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I have been listening to the Twixt podcasts for nearly six years, but have been part of the silent majority. However, as a Milwaukee resident, it is time to put in my two cents. There wasn't a lot of data to go on, but my tentative assessment and plan is as follows. This is a 48-year-old male who was recently diagnosed as HIV positive with a CD4 count less than 100, presenting the di- with diarrhea, cachexia, fever, hypotension, tachycardia, and tachypnea. My differential diagnosis includes diarrheal, secondary parasitic etiologies, for example, cryptosporium, giardia, and amoeba, Cystoisospora or cyclospora. Fungal etiologies, for example, microsporidian species, viral etiologies, HIV, CMV, uh, HSV, or HHV 8. Bacterial etiologies, for example, Mycobacterium avium complex, MAC, Vibrio cholera, C. diff, C. E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, or Campylobacter, or Non-infectious etiologies, for instance, uh, lymphoma or inflammatory bowel disease. Because the show's name is This Week in Parasitism, the patient's immunocompromised status, the severe watery diarrhea, the weight loss, and my Milwaukee intuition, (laughs) cryptosporidiosis is suggested. Fluid and electrolyte management should be initiated as well as heart. The stool should be examined via cultures, toxin assays, and ONPs. Staining techniques can reveal the presence of cryptosporidium as well as other parasites. The patient does, in fact, have cryptosporidiosis, and the medication is tolerated by the patient. Nitazoxanide can be initiated. Although I am too young to remember the cryptosporidium outbreak in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I am sure Dixon can enlighten us all. We are briefly mentioned in your book. Thank you for all your hard work. Zach. We actually, you actually told that story I did. a long time ago. Yeah, a long time. On a twip. Yep, that's true. When we used to do the parasites one by one. Just about. a long time ago. It was How long ago was that outbreak? Uh, in the 90s, 1990s. I want to say 92. Am yeah. I? That's actually, we you should, could look we it should up in our Google book. We should Google it. Actually, it is in our book. So yeah. let me. In fact, during the outbreak, in. as I recall, uh, half of the city did and the other half of the city did not receive contam- contaminated water. Right. Because they were changing the filters in the water filtration system. And there was a spring storm which melted the snow and and washed effluent from the slaughterhouse mm-hmm. into Lake Michigan and then was taken back in via the intake pipes. From right. The, uh, right. Yeah. And, so let's and see. People we have who a... didn't know they had AIDS caught cryptosporidium and they died from it, basically. This was yeah. a, a, a sad, sad day in the history of, of – it was also the largest single outbreak traceable back to a single oh, point source uh, in diarrheal disease history of a city sanitations, at least. So I'm sure Milwaukee has learned its lessons since Zach, then. Zach, go back to TWIP number 18 – Cryptosporidium. 
We recorded on October 25th, 2010. My goodness. We're getting old. We are. Wow. wow. That's six years ago, almost. Seasons. To the We're day. getting seasoned. This is seasoned, not old. <laughs> Vincent and Dixon discussed the intracellular parasite <clears throat> Cryptosporidium, which causes diarrheal disease in most mammalian species. Right. I'm glad I got that right. Right. <laughs> uh, Daniel, can you do that? So in 1993, one? the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, experienced the largest waterborne outbreak of dial okay. disease ever documented in the United States. I'm mm-hmm. quoting this, um, this <laughs> what, textbook. What which, a legacy. Which hopefully, legacy. Zach, hopefully you can share with your medical college of hey, Wisconsin um, comrades out there. That's right. Um, go to download the book. Download the book for free. Exactly right. All right. Wink writes. <clears throat> Dear Twit Professors, as it says in the sixth edition, <laughs> diarrhea may quoted. be severe with several liters per day of diarrhea due to cryptosporidiosis. That's my guess. <laughs> I have seen many advanced <laughs> HIV patients waste to a marked degree, as did your patient, and cryptosporidium is often their presenting opportunistic infection. Mm. My only reservation is that in HIV, severe infections usually occur at a lower CD4 count and improve when it comes up to 75 CD4 per oh, ml. Nice. I wonder if our truck driver ingested a hefty dose of cysts in his travels. Wink, Weinberg, Atlanta. Yeah. And I did. Remember I called out a little bit to Wink? Trust your intuition. Don't. Because he, he, I was worried he would overthink it. But fortunately, he stuck. He did? He stuck with his he first. He did. He went with the first one. Can I go back to another comment someone else made just now? Is that a cancerous growth on his perianum, or is that's that- yeah, it's an HPV related? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, okay, that's okay. unfortunate. All right, and what could that be surgically removed? Uh, they're actually topical chemotherapy. Okay, uh, wow. Yeah. So he's he's actually a guy I just um, saw in clinic two weeks ago, and he's being followed by us, the oncologists. All right, what, but what did you do next with this gentleman? All right, I think I said our last time that we sent off stool studies which were revealing. That's right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, in, this, in this case, we went ahead and we sent off this multiplex GI panel. And that, that was positive for Cryptosporidium parvum. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this, this GI panel and um, you know, it relative to other... Um, say, diagnostic modalities. I think we're probably seeing more cryptosporidium um, diagnoses because of the sensitivity of this assay. It's a PCR assay. Um, it's PCR. It's a multiplex PCR assay, and it has a number of bacteria, so it can detect um, different Campylobacter, so Campylobacter jejuni, coli, Upsilianus, um, Clostridium difficile toxins, um, um, Salmonig- Salmonella, um, or Cinea anticlitica, or also a bunch of parasites, or so Cryptosporidium, uh, Cyclospora, Entamoeba histolytica, Giardia, and then a whole range of viruses, um, as well as other bacteria that, <clears throat> I don't know why they sort of list them down below, but all your different um, E. coli, and actually gives you sort of breaks downs of different types of E. coli. Um, but it's really been great in letting us know exactly what's going on in, mm. in the stool. Sure. Um, the culture, as... Dixon mentioned is is not really a great um, way of making this diagnosis. No. Even the stool, let's say you go ahead and you send it off and you say, let's do a stool microscopy. Um, a lot of the studies suggest that's only going to give us the diagnosis 30% of the time. Hmm. So this this ability to do the um, PCR-based testing is has been great in allowing us to really identify who has this infection. Yep. Um, so then what do you do? That's it. He, <clears throat> he had it and did you treat him? Because one of these... Individual said, I guess the fellow from Sweden says virtually untreatable. Sorry. Yeah. They're, they're no, and actually and and no and, and that is unfortunately that's that's true. Is um it's not easy to treat. We did a lot of what people mentioned. First we stabilized this gentleman. Mm-hmm. He was he was critically ill. So he required lots of fluid to rehydrate. Um and actually so he could correct the acid base disturbances that associated uh, lactated ringers. We gave him lactated ringers, <laughs> lots of lactated ringers. He actually was on a bicar drip at one point because he was so so acid, metabolically acidotic. And that's what a lot of the rapid breathing was about. Lungs were clear. He was trying to correct this acid base Lungs disturbance. Were clear. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So he was, you know, dehydrated and breathing really rapidly to correct the acid base. Uh, he was started on his HIV medications. He was given nitazoxamide, 
Um, but it was very slow for his immune system to start to come back and sure. for the diarrhea to start to abate. So he spent a long time in the hospital. Wow. Did you get his CD4 counts up? His C4 count has improved somewhat, but I think it was a really long time. Um, and then, you know, we saw him again recently, and there was gaps in the treatment. Mm-hmm. So it's bad. his C4 count is still under 200. Hmm. Is he fully cognizant of what's wrong? You know, it's it's hard to know how much insight he has when someone um, stops taking medications for a period of time. You sort of wonder, are they not quite appreciating um, the severity of the infection? When they just start to feel better a little bit, they figure it's gone, and then they go back to the old ways, right? Denial or whatever else. Yeah, on. yeah. And plus, he's got the potential for spreading this infection, the HIV infection, to other people, right? Through unprotected that's, sex. That's tough. I mean, at this point, I would say he's no longer sexually active, but he was sexually active. Yeah. He had high viral load, so he was uh, very contagious. Wow. Um, it's a well, problem. It's- they, they talk about treatment as prevention because you treat somebody, not only can you help them, yeah. Um, but that's a way to help stem the epidemic, prevent them from spreading it. Of course. The sex workers were probably already infected. That's right. probably where it came from. It came from worker. them, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's it's true. tough. Then you think about the stress of losing your father and taking that long trip and then taking partic- participating in the funeral and then coming back. That that all must have taken its toll on his health and dropped him down below a certain period. Yeah. Otherwise, he wouldn't have come into the hospital, right? <laughs> I mean, he was not in the hospital before he exactly. went on this trip. Exactly. Right? That's only three weeks. I mean, look how fast downhill you can go in just three weeks. Yeah. That's quite amazing. And I think, you know, part, part of the reason I, um, you know, you have all these different cases of cryptosporidium, which one do you pick? And and one that I, I thought was helpful for our, for oh, our listeners was this is the number one cause of diarrhea in, in the immunocompromised patient in Mali. So sure. sort of a... Encourage mm-hmm. people to Google, use use the internet <laughs> yeah, to help them out. Yep. And I also liked the fact that it was more than three liters. It was it was very sort of a classic, <laughs> just this real voluminous um, diarrhea yeah. that was occurring yep. in in advanced, we'll say advanced HIV. Yep. You know, compromise. Yep. Yeah. Wow. All right, everybody got it right. They did two in, two weeks in a row. Everybody got it. Well, you know, uh, we might be easing up a little bit. I hope Daniel will come up with a stuff. Or maybe one. maybe our listeners are just getting too darn <laughs> you think, smart. You maybe, think they're all downloading the may, sixth edition? No. <laughs> may, well, well, I I'm think hoping that's part they're of doing it. That's got to be part of it. <laughs> yeah, and edition. maybe we're actually succeeding in helping get a little bit of parasitic yeah, disease education out there. That's, so. the, goal. that's the goal of Parasites Without <laughs> Borders, right? You got it right. Is that our mission? It is. That's what I understand. It's mine. <laughs> but you couldn't download the previous edition, so... No. Now, for the next year, you'll see everybody's going to get them right. This is we're going to have to make these really tough. No, when unless I, the book is wrong. <laughs> oh no, no. When I when I read these emails, and I, I wonder if like people listening in are sort of cheering and and sort of hoping that the because I like it when our listeners mm. get it right. Oh no, of course. Of course so every time they get it right and they you have bet. all these yeah. great insights, I'm sort of cheering for them, thinking like this is great. Yes, that's right. And now you don't have to go to Google to do a search. You can just go to the book. That's Go true. to the book. Just put in three liters. <laughs> that three liters of point. <laughs> three liters <laughs> Molly. Comes right up. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. It's not like TWIP. We have ads now. We, We're not ad-free. This is an ad. <laughs> <laughs> they have over 1,500 titles and 600 hours of content founded by John Hendricks, who used to be with Discovery Channel. So- that means you're accessing real science shows. You can get it on the web, on the Apple TV, Roku, or any of the other devices that interface the web with your TV. It's available in 196 countries worldwide. I wonder if they can get it in Mali. Of course they can. I wonder. Probably. Be, when I go to the DR on Sunday, I'm going to try, see if I can the DR, stream I'm curiosity. Sure get it there. <laughs> it's on the web. If you have web, you can get it. Okay. Wide variety of science, technology, nature, history, documentaries, interviews, lectures. You're going to love it. For example, Stephen Hawking's favorite places, brand new documentary where he pilots a fantastical CGI spaceship across the universe, stopping at some of his favorite destinations. Digits is a three-part series hosted by the founder of YouTube's science channel, or a YouTube science channel, Veritasium, Derek Mueller. Deep Time History is three-parter on the story of the universe's 14 billion year history and much, much more. You know, you can just go to curiositystream.com and search for science. You don't have to even log in. You can see all the good stuff that they have. Enrich Your Life 
and continue learning with one of the largest nonfiction, super high definition libraries around. That's 4K, over 50 hours of 4K content. They have monthly and annual plans available, and they start at just $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe during signup to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of parasitic diseases. No, their support of TWIP, right? They're not supporting parasitic diseases. Well, that was a nice slip, though. <laughs> I did it on purpose, Dixon. Yes, you did. You know, sometimes I do that. Even bugging you, I do on purpose. <laughs> no, I thought that was subconscious. <laughs> Knee-jerk response. No, no, no. It's fun to bug you. Okay, you can try all you wish, but... I, it doesn't bother you at all, not right? Really. Okay, good. Really. I'm very glad. I'm glad you have a thick skin. We have a paper selected by Daniel Griffin, M.D., from PLOS and, P- and PhD. PhD, PhD too? Also, yeah. That's right. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Exactly right. I thought we had some confusion about that, Dixon. You know, I always, har- I always harass everyone in the lab when they're like, Dr. Griffin. I'm like, so which doctor are you which looking at this morning? Which talking about, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Depends on what the answer is. <laughs> PLOS neglected tropical diseases. One health interactions of Chagas disease vectors, canid hosts, and human residents along the Texas-Mexico border. Wow. Garcia, O'Day, Fisher, Hoch, Gorkachev, Patino, Arroyo, Lang, Lopez, Ingber, Jones, and Murray from, wow, Baylor College of Medicine, University of Texas at Houston, um, University of Texas in Brownsville, the University of Texas, Rio Grande, that's in Edinburgh, Texas, and another University of Texas in Houston, and Emory University in Atlanta, wow. Big collaboration here. How the Georgians get involved? What's this all about? <laughs> they let him in. What is this all about, Daniel? Right. So the, you know, we we had some people um, ask us to do. I guess I'll call it more macroscopic, like mm-hmm. the whole interaction between parasites and and society. And I thought this was a nice one. It had just come out in PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases, and it's a whole discussion of the different interactions and the autochronous. Did I pronounce that Autochthonous. 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 You know, I even tried practicing this. (laughs) Autochthonous. Um, Basically, the transmission is Chagas being transmitted in the U.S. And can we find it in insects here? Can we find it in people that have lived their whole life here? Can we find it in dogs, coyotes? And it is in Mexico, right over the border. We know it's in Mexico. We know it's down and through Central and And, South America. And the bugs that transmit it, of course, do not respect borders so right? building that wall right. may or may not help <laughs> well that's the issue is the is we're going to talk, yeah, uh, talk about that how high does the wall have to be to prevent the with a duvido from going over it <laughs> they can fly as high as they want you know giuliani said that, the other day they're not building a wall that was just <laughs> he said that yeah that was just really he's yeah con- he's, he's he's the president gonna, of the united no, no, states I think trump yeah. didn't trump i'll say we're going to build a, a, a few feet of fence i think <laughs> <laughs> no, no, wall, no we we, we <laughs> We should probably save this for another time. <laughs> no, there's no wall. This is another no show. Wall. So it says here, uh, Daniel, that Chagas disease is the leading cause of non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. What is non-ischemic as opposed to ischemic? Yes. Um, no, is- yes? That was, not a yes? that was not a yes question. <laughs> yes, that is an excellent question. No, I'm, I'm glad. Vincent does a good job of bringing out, I he think, does. the questions that our listeners would want clarified. He does. Um, as do you, Dixon. Oh, thank you. And uh, <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> as does everyone else in the room. That's no. right. That's right. That's right. All the other listeners that are silently looking. So we break down heart disease. Yeah, you, I would say you can break things down into different ways, but this is a very helpful distinction. And um, ischemic heart disease is where the heart is being damaged or diseased because of a lack of blood supply and oxygen, mm-hmm. um, vital nutrients. So like coronary um, artery So this disease, exactly, right? coronary yeah. artery disease, hardening of the arteries, exactly. that would all be ischemic heart disease. It would. And then non-ischemic heart disease would be this whole other grab bag, sort of everything else, infections, toxins, drugs. Yeah. Um, and here, basically, they're pointing out, which is a major issue, is just how many people are suffering from non-ischemic heart disease due to this infection. Correct. So it's uh, dilated, that part of it, what does that mean? 
when when the heart um, is damaged by Chagas, in it loses this um, mechanically advantageous bullet shape, and it becomes dilated, nice. swollen, enlarged, and rounded. And not only is it larger, but it also is is less effectively shaped. If you were to go to the sixth edition and look this up, you can actually see a picture of that heart. I know. I I've been remember I took that picture and put it on the website. <laughs> is it on? Do the you website? remember? That's great. I did that. For you, of course, but I saw that picture. You said, we're going to use this because it's gross. We want to gross people out. Do you remember? This is like, uh, no, this is Howard Stern that now. That's, we're that's, getting into Howard Stern country here. We are. I'm, yell- I'm yelling at you. We should probably tone it down a bit, don't you think? Okay, let's, let's yeah. tone it down. Let's, yeah, let's so do in like our, an FM late night uh, show of uh, classical in, music. <laughs> this, this infection is transmitted by the Reduvido. You like to say that. Right, Trypanosoma cruzi. That's right. And you get bitten, and how does the bug deposit the trypanosomes into you? Uh, I know you like to talk about this. Not directly, that's for sure. Not uh, directly? They actually defecate to make room for the new blood meal. And in so, doing so... So they bite drinking blood, right? They drink the blood. Uh, the blood pushes out the contents of the large intestine, mm. out the anus of the bug, onto the skin. And the the uh, infectious stage, the meta. Metacyclic trypanum. Uh, then you scratch it and you get it in. Uh, well, the bite itself induces an itching, yeah, which facilitates the spread of this parasite. So male and female bugs will take blood meals? Yeah. Mm. They do. Now, do sometimes if you get it in the eye, you can rub it in the eye, then you, you get some kind of eye. What's the eye infection called? There's a name for that. Romagna, side. Romagna, yeah, yeah and that's old. And I think, yeah, and I think that's, that's the right. you know often is where you'll see it. They'll bite on the face because that's yeah. exposed. And they'll they'll make a break, and then you'll either rub the feces into the wound or into the conjunctiva. And either way, they the tripomastigote infectious stage can penetrate and Correct. and infect mm-hmm. um, and invade the cells. And then that's right. Now here's a question, another question: uh, Do 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 reduvidos pick up? Uh, the infectious form from a human or from an animal reservoir, a non-human animal the reservoir. The answer is yes. Both, right? Yeah, so sure. it can go human, human. And what are some of the animals that participate? Every one of them. Dogs, all mammals, coyotes, all the mice, guinea yeah. pigs, rats, guinea pigs. Guinea pigs. We did, did we do guinea pigs? We didn't, but we could. <laughs> Regular pigs, cows, <laughs> ducks. Uh, I've run out of animals. Do they? Do they? Not do they? <laughs> They're not mammals. They're birds. Yeah, I was trying to figure out if they get. Are they ducks. birds? Yeah. So they don't get infected. No. I think it's just mammals. Just yeah. Mammals. I don't. I don't think it's birds. But almost every South American mammal is uh, has been shown to be infected. What about bats? Can bats get? I don't you know. know about, I don't. I don't know. know the answer to that, but I think the answer is no because they have a higher body temperature. But we'll see in a minute because we're going to look. The at only it. way would be if a bat's sleeping, and they reduce <laughs> or it, hibernating. It, yeah, because otherwise they're too fast for the reduvido to catch it. Mm, I wouldn't go that far because the so? vampire bat creeps up on its host in order to drink the blood, so it takes its time. So it might be slow enough to get caught by a reduvid, but I don't think the reduvids. It's looking controversial in bats. I'm seeing different. Well, but you could have an experimental studies. infection in bats just to see if it works. It over 100 different wildlife mammal species are competent mm-hmm. reservoirs. Mm-hmm. Whoa! Could you name a hundred different mammals? Given enough time, <laughs> a long car trip, right? See, I just got back. <laughs> yeah, it's a wait. good car trip. Game. My wife and I just got back from a trip to Bolivia. Now, Bolivia is known to be a hot bed source for T. cruzi infection, and we were conscious of this. We slept in some pretty dicey places on our trip, and your uh, eyes are a little swollen, you know. <laughs> That's because she hit me the there when I said, "Watch out for that." You know, the, the principal export of Bolivia is tin. So they say. I learned that in like sixth grade. Yeah, well, you should learn something else now. I the never tip, forgot it. One of the, well, we won't go there. This okay. is a politically uh, <clears throat> hot football. Now, um, oh, you know, you, you start talking about Bolivia, and I forgot what I was going to say. Anyway, here they look to, for evidence in Texas, right on the border. Yep. In counties right on the border, they look in dogs, right. they, which they get at the pound, Right, mm-hmm. so these That's are right. strays that have been picked up. That's they, correct. They get coyotes, and these have actually all been sera that have been s- sampled years before. That's true. I don't think yeah. they actually caught why, coyotes. Why did you this. think they did that for coyotes? Why do you think they sampled their blood for coyotes anything? in particular? Yeah, because there's another disease that they're worried about. Really, rabies. That's the one. Uh. That is the one. So the coyotes <laughs> for shaga is nothing special there, right? 
not really. But the, the the point is that they were always worried about immigration of, of coyotes, not not people, yeah, yeah. but coyotes. And well, if you build a wall, the coyotes will stay out. <laughs> I know they'll just dig a hole. <laughs> they dig the under fence. it. <laughs> of course, <laughs> they're pretty clever animals. Are there a lot of coyotes in this area? Many, 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 many. We're starting to have them here in many, New Jersey. You know, many, many. And you know, there was a time when there wasn't a single coyote east of the Mississippi River. And what happened? A pregnant female walked across a bridge on along the Mississippi. That was all, that's you, how they that got was it. all that was needed. That's all you needed. Wow, it was, it was bound to happen eventually. But the control of rabies, particularly feral dog rabies, is dependent upon uh, baiting the entire border between Mexico and the United States with the uh, edible vaccine. And they also caught some reduvid bugs and looked in them. They do. Mm-hmm. Now, the whole point here is that this area is considered endemic, but they don't have good evidence. And they wanted you to know, collect some more, right? But it's not just reduvid bug. It's reduvidae, but there are many species of yeah. triatomid. Triatomids. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Not triatomid? <laughs> not triatomid. The triatomid. <laughs> triatomid. These words are all made up. It's so how what's it was, the difference? Well, this is true. <laughs> okay, so we one of the things in this area, which is very sobering, uh, they say there's a lot of Hispanic communities in this region, which people have moved from Mexico. They have an unprecedented poverty rate and living conditions that um, allow for easy um, access to vectors. Um, now, Dixon, one of the ways you can get bitten is at night when you're sleeping, right? They're, yes. they're nested in your house they are is that the most likely time or is, can you get it walking around outside as well you can but you know if you're a person this is a pretty large object the bug is big right it's very large so you would you would bat it away you would so it's usually getting bitten while you're sleeping while right sleep and which is why they're called kissing bugs have you ever been bitten by a kissing bug no daniel i have never been bitten by a kissing but bug. do you know who was bitten a lot by kissing bugs it was darwin I was going to say that. Did he get chagas? <laughs> no. Well, we don't know the answer to that question. We on, don't on know. On the Galapagos? No, he was in Valparaiso. Yeah. And he got bitten in Valparaiso. There was the story where he wakes up covered Correct. in reduvid oh, bugs. They really? didn't call them yeah. reduvids. They called them um, vicuña bugs, I believe. Yes. That was the name of the bug. So they collected, they received 115 triatomine, is that right? Triatomine. Triatomine insects that were collected in Perry domestic areas by citizens across six counties in Texas. Correct. They were shipped alive to the University of Texas for exactly. processing exactly. PCR. So it's a little study, but interesting. Coyote samples. <laughs> they had 199 coyote samples. 16 right. were, were seropositive. Yep. It's 8%. Exactly. And interestingly, they provide a map, and you can see which counties right on the border. It's a very interesting map, indeed. In fact, it's all summarized there. They look at coyotes, dogs, and humans. That's right. In terms of numbers, uh, the canines, they had uh, 209 canine samples. Eight were positive. That's 3.8%. It's not a lot, right? No, it's not a lot. Because you don't need much. But I think it's also important to notice that they were only looking at um, very young dogs because they're trying yeah. to do a um, yeah. trying to do an insulin incidence yeah. versus prevalence yeah. so yeah. if you consider that if you look at these dogs who are less than i think it was six months old do you right. know what the cutoff was and you're already seeing at four percent just imagine if you just took dogs that were older so you let them continue yeah. to be exposed yeah, yeah. and notice um, that the, the concentration of positivity among people and dogs is the southernmost <clears throat> yeah. county That's in right. texas near, near corpus christi mm-hmm. uh Canines. Uh, we Should we talk that, about how the dogs are getting infected? How would you think, Vince, and the dogs uh, are getting infected? Because this is a question. good. This is a good point. This is a fascinating question. So they say dogs are a good indicator of yeah of infection. Peri domestic, right? Right. Uh, so how, how do the, do the dogs, dogs get infected? That's right. I would guess they're being bitten by triatomines. No, they're being triatomin. bitten triatomines. Oh, that can't be then. <laughs> <laughs> They're not being bitten? No, No, of course they're being bitten, but is that how they're actually getting infected? Would they actually then scratch and rub it into their eyes, do you think? With their hands? No, their hands. (laughs) Their little little paws? (laughs) Are they being bitten by coyotes? No. They're usually eating the bugs. They eat the bugs. They They eat the bugs. They see the bug, and they eat the bug. And that's become a change in transmission in areas, particularly Brazil. We're now seeing a shift from getting this infection yeah, through right. a bite that's to right. you grind up sugar cane, you make your <laughs> drink and you unbeknownst to you, you're eating reduvid uh, bug feces, reduvid bug. Sure. Um, Interesting. You stuff know, containing trypha So the coyotes and then you can too? orally acquire it. Coyotes so the same coyotes way? are probably eating, sure. eating the bugs. So in fact, Absolutely. any animal, any mammal is probably eating them, right? Cause they're not yes. going to be scratching. 
That is yeah. correct. So there's an oral exposure. So there's back another back. Uh, nuance to all of this, of course. They examine many different species of tritoman, right? Mm-hmm. Not just one. So there are many. If you look at, um, I have a website called uh, Medical Ecology, and I have a section on Chagas disease, and I have a section on the distribution of these species of tritoman throughout South America and Central America. Uh, the the species that bites animals mm-hmm. in the northern uh, part of of Mexico and the southern part of the United States are not the kind that would express a portion of their gut contents during the taking of the blood meal. Mm. Which one so if they be? bit us, we probably wouldn't get in. Uh, which ones don't do that? Well, there's a list, and I'm not. I didn't okay. commit that to memory, but there are there are differences between the ones that do transmit to humans and the ones that don't. They collected 115 different tri- triatoma species. Yes. And they were in different triatoma gersteckeri, triatoma, cru- <laughs> triatoma <laughs> lecularia, and triatoma sanguisuga. Sanguisuga. That's right, sanguisuga. That's right. Uh, and they varied. You know, um, this one, triatoma gersteckeri, 96% of them were positive. How about that? And the others were less, 2% and 0.9%. So they must have a prevalence for no, I th- I would actually, maybe coyotes or dogs. No, I think I was actually of the ones they collected, the most common insect collected was the Gersteckeri. But yeah, the majority of them, yeah. 111, yeah. But the majority of the um, reduvid bugs in their study were positive. Yes, yes. 56% that's positive. That's an enormous rate. Isn't that? I mean, vector. that's quite something. Right? It is. So they're biting animals of they different are. sorts, right, who, are, right. who have parasites in the right. blood, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. and they they went into the ecology of all this too because the uh, the the coyote dens that they dig into the soil yes are cooler when you go down below the ground yeah. you can get down below a certain level it's nice and cool down there well yep. the reduvids yep. like that I'm never there. climbing in a coyote den again you should never do that <laughs> in the, in <laughs> never the, going uh, in you're there crazy for even <laughs> thinking of what's going the name back. of the, what's the name of the form in the reduvid the parasite form. Well, there's uh, several. Uh, there's an epimastigote, and mm-hmm. then there's the metacyclic tripomastigote. Are they reproducing in the bug? Oh, yeah, okay. sure, absolutely. And the bug is fine, though, right? It doesn't get dilated That's cardio. That's great question. doesn't get dilated cardiomyopathy. No, because it stays in the gut <laughs> tract. It actually just eats a portion of the blood meal that the, uh, okay. the reduvid bug ate. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So then they got three. We should probably do the life cycle. Remember, we used to do life cycles. We well, while we're here, let's. We used we should. So as we talked about, the triple mastigote and is the infective form, correct? And then That's it, true. and then it loses its mast. It loses its flagellum and becomes the a mastigote. That's right. Um, and then there's it's you're going to actually get this. Um, you're going to get extracellular and intracellular forms. This is all true. And the extracellular forms are going to be acquired by the kissing bug. And those right. extracellular forms are going to undergo the sexual reproduction right. in the triatome. Right. Out comes the trypomastigote. But meanwhile, in the human being, you're going to have these intracellular amastigotes that are getting into um, smooth muscle tissue right. in general, predominantly. So you're mm-hmm. going to have cardiac issues. You're going to have um, megacolon, megaesophagus. True. Um, and a lot of the pathology we are concerned about may be initiated during the acute initial infection. That's right. Because we're not seeing a lot of success when we take someone who's, I should say, this is important, who chronically infected. When you get infected with Chagas disease, Mm -hmm. you probably don't clear it. Right. And probably a third of everyone who gets infected will develop a cardiac or a gastrointestinal manifestation. A lot of that is localized to several strains of the uh, infection, T. Uh, T. cruzi. But I, I wanted to also mention another possible route of infection in animals. Mm-hmm. If they can catch this infection by eating a reduvid bug, do you think a coyote could catch it by eating an infected mouse? Sure. I do too. Sure, definitely. I do too. So maybe the mouse is the primary vector for coyotes because that's all they eat, basically. They're rodent eaters. Yeah. And, and I've seen them sure. hunt because they're all over Yellowstone National yep. Park as well. Yeah, why not? So, so that could be a, a stumbling block to controlling this infection. If you had some control measure for the reduvid bug, it still wouldn't work maybe for the, for the life cycle outside of the human yeah. realm because the animals are carnivorous. We had a case where you had an elderly man with heart problems secondary to shock. I think he was only in his 50s. He was quite young. He's, that's old. <laughs> so. He's he, a young man. You were, we were talking about whether to treat him or not because... Yeah, he was from El Salvador, I think yeah. it was. Yeah. So aside from the, the Americas, where else do we find uh, 
the cruzi throughout. So it's Central we call it South yeah we call it American trypanosomiasis because it is it's well we're now seeing southern U.S. Yep. Mexico right. Central America and South America. Correct is the range of the triatomids controlled by temperature. Like mosquito I was told, ranges. Yeah, you know, I asked about this because as we were in Bolivia, we were in lowlands and then we moved up to some very high altitudes. And I I asked as to, they were very much aware of this infection, by the way, and they have to warn their uh, clients that they're in a zone of transmission for not only malaria, but leishmaniasis and for uh, trypanosomiasis as well. And the answer is yes. There is a there is a uh, an altitude um, restriction mm-hmm. for this infection, but... Like I said, Darwin acquired it in Valparaiso. So he actually climbed up over the, the peaks of Andes and looked down into the Amazon basin. And mm-hmm. that's where he got the light bulbs went on for him in terms of um, geology and evolution. Um, you know, there was a wonderful survey of all the states of the United States that have the this particular bug. Mm-hmm. And are you ready for this? 28 of the, of the states of the United States have it. And... The closest one to us is we can see it. New Jersey. <laughs> they have triatomids, yeah. Yes, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas. Right. Give, basically follow that line so across. New York Colorado, doesn't have Utah. any? No, we don't have them. We don't let them across. We're going to let them. <laughs> there, was, there was an issue, I think, one time where they were trying to get across, and fortunately, <laughs> Christie shut down the bridges. They did. He did <laughs> that, and, post, you know, and he's he, getting all this flack, and I'm just like, just tell him the truth, Christy. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, did you ever? Did you see any in Bol- Bolivia? No, we you thought we did at one point. We, you know, I, we were, it was very late at night. We were led to these very beautiful, thatched-roofed, um, resort-like cabins. And I looked at my wife and I said, oh, my God, look at those roofs. Did you put oh a blanket on your face? No, I didn't. No, of course not. And as we walked in, <clears throat> the, the bottom of the floor was not wood. It was salt. Uh-huh. We were well, in a we place where the salt, salt flats were. And they yeah. built these buildings out of bricks made out of salt. And the roofs were, of course, thatched. Well, thatched roofs, those are, you know, and you start mm-hmm. thinking, oh, my God. And here are a couple of very large bugs dead on the floor and I didn't want to go up close to look at them and finally I said oh, I've got to do this because I, I can't not tell my wife that we're living in a hut that's got reduvids in it and it turned out to be crickets <laughs> they were very large crickets so the answer was we didn't see any right. reduvids the other piece of data here they have found uh, very few people seropositive 3 out of 841 human right. samples right. now these 3 people are all elderly and had lived had been born and lived in Mexico correct except for one no except no, for this in case one, one was born in central Mexico. Taste two. Actually, no. Case one, 76 year old female born in Canary, Texas. Oh, but the mother, that's right. I see. Yeah. Canary, Texas. Let's see. Case two uh, was uh, was born in San born Luis in, Potosi. That's Mexico. Yeah. Case three was born in Matamoros. Okay, two out of three. We yeah. don't know where any of them got infected. No, that's no um, idea. It could yeah, be Mexico, no maybe the they U.S. Because the woman that was born in the United States could have gone back to visit relatives in Mexico too, and that and you could have yeah, picked it up sure, that sure. way. So there's no epidemiology of, of origin, right? Which is too bad because we would love to know the answer to that, wouldn't we? Well, I think that's one of the big questions here: Are people acquiring Chagas exactly. disease and, in the United States? I just wanted to calm the people of the United States down a little bit by saying that. Yes, we have species of reduvid bugs in 28 different states, but almost none of them carry trypanosomiasis <laughs> because the yeah. infection isn't here. It's the vector, but it's not the infection. Yeah, I mean, they try to make the point, I say, with one of the three positive participants having a lifelong history of living in Texas. But mm. as pointed out, you know, you, you, not good you, enough. Know, you would need to no. say, and no history of traveling to a another area that might have been a, sure place for so for the n clients. in this is pretty low yeah, it's an n of we one like some very higher ends in order to say of the thousands of people that live in right. like say big ben texas you know 23 so, of them had the infection is that, there we, we can't any, say that yet is there any confirmed t cruzi infection in the u.s yes actually there is yeah oh there have been it, not not acquired. in the paper. Many. There acquired, are many. acquired in the U.S. Yes. yes. Not by transfusion. Oh, okay. They're, they're, by a bug. for qualifying. By yes. a bug. Yeah, yes, by, by bugs. By bugs. In Texas. So there was there was a famous case. Actually, I would say two famous cases that I remember being well documented. One is a gentleman who currently lives in Montana mm-hmm. um, who is documented. <laughs> 
um, and he never ever traveled outside the U.S. The other um, was a case of um, they had gone to summer camp in Texas. Was the exposure? I'm trying to figure out if this is the same really? or different people, but really. Um, so there've been at least one or two um, where they've never seen them leave the U.S. No, but Texas was the potential place where they were. Yeah, it's real local, rare. Corpus Christi in 1955, locally acquired human case. It's yeah. incredibly so it's, rare. It's not in very fact. rare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But I guess what they're trying to suggest is maybe not so rare, you know, you consider the prevalence, but yeah, I would Do agree. Do a bigger study. Well, we yeah. might, I mean, uh, the, the parasites are there. They're in bugs. They're in mammals. But it's quite. What, a, it's almost a question of when, what, you know, right? Who knows about people, right? What? But the way the mammals catch it are different than the way we Yeah. Do. So they're, I think that is the big issue. It could be in the bugs, it could be in the dogs, the coyotes, but what puts you at risk is either the bugs dropping down onto your face while you're sleeping, which you can basically avoid by not having thatched houses Correct. with big bugs in them. And the second is the outbreaks we see where you grind stuff up and it ends up in what you're going to consume. Well, I have a third scenario that I'd like okay. to suggest. And that <laughs> is there's a bounty on a lot of these coyotes. People hunt them. When they do, of course, they sell the pelts. Mm -hmm. So to get the pelt off of a dead coyote, you'd have to cut it. And cutting it means that you're placing yourself at risk also. It's like tularemia. It's the same danger for tularemia. Sure. So I can imagine some bounty hunter for uh, coyote pelts yeah, yeah. Uh, nicking themselves. And, you know, of course, your hands are all nicked up anyway because you're an outdoorsman. There you go. The next thing you know, you've got the trypanosomes going from coyote to people. All right. So what's your, what are your overall thoughts on this study, uh, Daniel and Dixon? Right. Re raising consumer awareness as to the, uh, the <laughs> parasites without borders concept. <laughs> well, I think, I think, you know, as we have this discussion right now, people talk about putting up walls and, and all the rest. It's and, uh, <clears throat> I mean, we're, we're seeing disease. You know, it really has no respect for borders. It doesn't, okay. it doesn't care. By the way, in the same area, they've spotted two Jaguars. Jaguars. Jaguar. In yeah, and two Cadillacs, both. No, Cadillac. that's just a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. I know, I know, I know. But these were real, genuine, live, four-legged jaguars that have uh, part of their territory comes across the, the Rio Grande River. Hmm. Now, if the Rio Grande River was flowing at the normal rate, which it's meant to flow at, but of course it isn't, then you would have never seen those animals. Yeah. Is it beautiful, the Rio Grande? It's gorgeous. Yeah, do they have high cliffs on either side, or is it flat? In a, in, in some, in a, some areas. Some areas. Yeah, it's a the big, big bend the, the, the Big Bend National Park in Texas is supposed to be absolutely yeah. stunning. And I'd love to get there sometime. Go ahead. Go. Yeah, now? You're going to send them? <laughs> All right, we'll see you later, Dixon. Right. <laughs> you, you, uh, I, think it's, I think it's important that we start doing, you know, we, we need to keep doing all the basic science. But this kind of stuff is important, too, I'm because sure. as we're it, seeing yeah. climate change, we're seeing where all these infections are. We're, oh, we're seeing it true. change. And as mentioned, these bugs are now all the way up here. They're just on the other side of that bridge. Yeah, but they and were I'm, always here. No, <laughs> not, that's not a good, I don't, I don't buy that one. It's not like malaria moving up the montane because of the uh, change in temperatures. So These, why do you think Chagas is moving into Texas? Or do you think it's always, it's always been, been there and we just never we just never noticed? It's always been there. It has always been there. And and reduvid bugs have been, they wax and wane with uh, seasons. Mm -hmm. Okay, just like screwworm. I mean, screwworm came back in Florida. It hasn't been there in 30 years. Next thing you know, there it is again. So there's back. a chance that it back. comes back. Right. And the same is for the distribution of uh, Aedes aegypti in the United States as well. That waxes and wanes depending mm -hmm. on temperature and climate and all those other things. So, but it's not here in New York. It's not here in New York, but it used to be. We had outbreaks long in fever time in New York. ago. We did have outbreaks long time in ago. fever. So, and we got rid of it by just sanitation, basically. So, I wonder what the actual population density of people are in these various counties. Yeah, they make these big estimates, but but I think we need you know you need to do the study. You need to not just find three positive we people. We need to do the study. That's um, the point. You, know, you, need, you need to look at <laughs> thousands more and really get a sense of what's there. And, yeah, there's, well, and I think because our treatments are not great, not, not really enough. Right? 900, 900. 900. 900 and they only found three positive. Yeah, not a lot. So you want thousands to get it. Yeah, we want. yeah, yeah, yeah. We do. And I mean, one of the things they can do, as we know, is we now screen all the blood that's being donated that's for right. whether or not they're positive. But Daniel, these people who were seropositive, mm -hmm. three, how do they know they weren't infected? Did they check? 
Well, so the people that were seropositive, they're trying to tell us that they believe that those people were infected. And one, so you, you would say they're still infected, still right? Infected. Once, and that's the problem. Yeah, Once okay. you get infected, you stay infected. And even if you're treated early on. It's well, these people weren't treated. These people were not. No, no, treated. but if you were at a early so stage. That, that's that? one of the things we're not sure about. And okay, that's the challenge it. is if you treat people, are you treating and are you getting sterilizing cure? Is it completely gone? And they, oh. they've done stuff where they do PCR to look. Um, these people were never treated. The other thing that they make a point, which I think is important to qualify, is that this serology testing is very sensitive, mm -hmm. but it has some issues with specificity. And right. so when you, as we talked about our gentleman from El Salvador, he was positive on a screening test. Yeah. We then went ahead and did two diagnostic quality tests to see if he really was infected. Mm -hmm. And it'll turn out a certain percent of people who appear positive. So we don't even know that their estimate may be too high. Got it. They may be using a yeah. test too sensitive, one that yeah. cross-reacts with yeah. Yeah, yeah. maybe leishmaniasis, and maybe what's going on is leishmaniasis is creeping into our So there's borders. another test that they could run on these people, not using sterile reduvid bugs to let them actually yeah. feed right, on the right, people, right? right. <laughs> That's a little bit severe That's to right. just yeah, take we've three talked people about, and put them through We've that. talked about that before, yes. Yeah, the, the xenodiagnosis. xenodiagnosis. Six and, uh, the animals, the mammals who are infected. yeah. Do they get infected for life? They do. Or they have any symptoms? Sometimes they, they develop do. dilated cardiomyopathy. Actually, sometimes dogs, they do. dogs, yeah, more rapidly and right. at a higher incidence than people. So this is actually a huge problem for yeah, yeah, from yeah. a veterinary perspective. Right. If you're looking at the incidence in these dogs, right, we're seeing what was it four percent in the first six months of life. So eight percent right. in the first year, and dogs live. You're starting to see a very high infection rate in dogs and. More than 30% of those dogs will very quickly develop an accelerated, dilated cardiomyopathy. And if you look around for the epidemiology for this, mm -hmm. you'll see, I mean, almost no village is without dogs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Dogs are useful for many reasons. And one is a pest control. The other is, uh, you know, companionship, of course. And, the, the, and, and light labor also. So dogs will never disappear from the peridomestic scene. And if that's the case... They will always be a reservoir host for T. cruzi. So, Dixon, what is the status of a Chagas vaccine? Very good question. We've covered some Wait, of these topics bit, we before. Have, what, maybe yeah. saliva? Is there, was there one with the, <laughs> immunizing with the, the saliva of the triatomids? I don't remember Remember's that one. I know that they were using uh, sand flies. Sand flies. That's leishmaniasis. leishmaniasis. Right. But I, they, it, it shouldn't be that difficult, but T. cruzi is a very difficult organism to work with. Because an accidental stick of the finger puts you in a situation that you don't want to be in. So according to the Sabin Vaccine Institute, yes. of which uh, your colleague is Peter, president, Peter, Peter Hotez, Hotez. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they are engaged in collaboration uh, working on a Shaga vaccine composed of two T. cruzi recombinant proteins plus yeah. alum. Right. Preclinical work includes initial expression and characterization, blah, blah, blah. Bless you. Thank you. So people are working Sorry. on it. Right. And uh, for some of us, it could be a travel vaccine. So if it were available, would you have gotten it going to Bolivia? No. Why not? No, because we weren't going to the endemic areas. Really? Nor were we spending much time in any area. Okay. Anything else? You oh, um, we yeah. forgot to mention how many people. This paper actually gives a number. It says something like 300,000 people within the United States have T. cruzi. And how many of those will develop heart disease? Fortunately, about a third. Wow. Yeah, so that's it's, 100, it's, it's that's it's a hundred thousand. It's a burden, and we're not even sure, um, based on some recent studies, that our treatment interventions can really change the natural history. Right. So it may be that a third of these people get it, and I'm not sure that we have effective treatments. Mm -hmm. um, How? So you frequently see cases here, right? So we were actually joking at one point. I felt like I turned my clinic at North Shore. I turned into the Chagas Clinic yeah, because as we screen. Um, people from you know Central South America who wanted to donate blood, right? I mean, they're trying to do something yeah, helpful, right. and then they, they get sent our way saying, you know, go I'm, talk to your doctor. Not, yeah, go <laughs> talk right. to your doctor. That's right. And then we uh, confirm, and we try to get Ben's Nizol from the CDC, and we fill out all the forms, and then it's horribly tolerated. And based upon the latest data, I'm not even sure how much um, yeah we're doing. Wow, and nifurtamox doesn't work any better. So. Dixon, we should do a parasite podcast. This is such interesting stuff. <laughs> Isn't this? We should. Let's just okay. put that down. Put that on a to do list. <laughs> okay, that's a great idea. I don't think people would listen. Nah. You don't think so? Nah. Uh, all right. 
We could see. It was an idea. We'll see. It's science. Let's do it, and then we'll see, and we'll keep track. Science is so tough, though. You don't have to think about it. Okay, Daniel. Let's get another case. (laughs) Oh, goody. Are we doing another? I look forward to this. Okay. Another one. You do, Dixon? I do. With much glee. (laughs) So we are heading back to Peru. Back to Peru. Back to Peru. This is a 55-year-old female from the Highland Central Valley area of southern Peru near Cusco. I've been there. Okay. How do you spell that? C-U-Z-C-O. And Peru, just P-E-R-U, just the way it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Pronounced beautifully, okay. by the way, Daniel. That was very good. Was, was that good? <laughs> um, this woman works um, in farming. And she does. She said she had no prior skin lesions, but she does have multiple hypopigmented scars on the body that she attributes to trauma. And now she's coming in reporting many years of bloody nasal discharge. Many years. Many years. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's so funny to hear that. What are you waiting for? A couple of years to come. To some, some, of us, to some of us are optimists, you know? Where did you She's see this young lady? Hoping I saw her. Um, she came to Lima to be seen. Because apparently after several years, she decided, you know, I should see someone about this. Because the local folks up here, they're not, they're not making this any better. So you were in Lima? I was in Lima. So she's seen in Lima. Cusco is not really close to Lima, but... And she is seen in Lima. It, it, uh, this is not the ER, right? Just no, no. This is a this is an outpatient it. clinic. So she's been in an outpatient clinic. Got it. And she's here for many years of bloody nasal discharge. Mm-hmm. She says prior to this, she had no other medical problems, no surgeries, not allergic to anything. She doesn't take anything. Um, she says everyone in the family's fine. Um, so it doesn't report any family diseases. How old is she again? I'm sorry. She is 55. Thank you. She's got a husband and kids. She has a husband and kids. Um, Mm -hmm. Kids are all grown now. Um, She's still working. What kind of farm is it? um, Let's see. I don't think I wrote down. Okay. Let's see. Like just um, plant material or does she husbandry also like... So she, she doesn't do husbandry herself, Llamas but there is or... exposure to um, lots of insects. There's cattle in the yeah. area. There's dogs okay. in the town. Sheep, um, sheep llamas, alpacas, alpacas, guinea pigs. Vicuña. Vicuña. <laughs> Monaco. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, she, she's lived in this whole area, and she doesn't report any travel except coming down to Lima to see the doctor because- yeah. When you say coming down, you mean coming down because <laughs> I mean, Cusco's pretty down. high up. Yep. So right. she's coming down to see the to see the doctor because she's got this bloody stuff from her nose, and she thinks there's a lesion there, and she wants um, wants the doctor to look. There, at there's it. no overt um, way of looking at the nose and saying, you know, you've got something wrong. Well, so we do look at it. So I'll give you that because I think this is important. And so we look in the right nair, right. And there is an ulcerated lesion inside, um, inside the no- inside the nose. I'll mm-hmm. say uh, uh, in the mucocutaneous, sort of a mucocutaneous lesion in the nose of this woman um, that it's been there for years. And as I mentioned before, we ask, "Have you ever had any kind of lesions on the rest of your body? Any things that wouldn't heal?" She says, "No," but we, when we look at her, we see many little hypopigmented scar areas on her body has she always had she says oh there's just you know i'm working as a farmer or i get little bits of trauma it's all Mm. good so she doesn't make much of those in the exposed portions of her body or in the uh clothed portion they're in the exposed in the the extremities Hmm. dixon you good you doing well here i think so you know but you know i've been wrong before (laughs) but i have a good idea what this might be huh now, as you're looking at the woman, is it bleeding? Um, right now, no. Now, this lesion, um, if you look at it, it has um, basically a, Good. what did you want to say? No, I just wondered about the blood work because you're going to get the laboratory. No, tests. I'm not going to give you blood work. I'm going to tell you at this point, then I'm going to leave it up to people because we're going to do a very simple test. That's gonna, oh, I see. We're going to do one test. I just want to know if she's good. anemic, that's all. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wanted to know that also. That's a good question. You can't tell us? She's not anemic. Thank you. She has no fever. <clears throat> she has no fever. Systemically, she feels fine. She just has this 
this ulcer in her nose that will not heal. And for how long has that been going on? Years. 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 Say, Many she's years. She's 55 years old. Yeah. So she's yeah, for years. had this like for five years or 10 years or 20 years or all her life. I don't know if I would say 10 or 20, but at least several years. Long time. Is, um, yep. Does she eosinophilic? Um, uh, she's not. She's not. She's not eosinophilic. And... Um, Actually, the white count was relatively unremarkable. So the labs are relatively unremarkable. Okay. Uh, she's HIV negative, right? She's HIV negative. Yep. Okay. And nobody else in her family has any. Yep. More. Everybody's good. This is not an epidemic of bed bugs. <laughs> this is not. <laughs> no. <laughs> and she's the only one in her family, as we mentioned, yeah. that has this, right? Husband, the grown children, um, just her. Fascinating. She, now, any travel the, history? Just living in this area. That's it. Does she remember the onset of this? She remembers years ago starting to have issues with, you know, some bloody drainage from her nose. Did it correspond with any particular activity? <clears throat> I mean, she wakes up in the morning with blood on her pillow. It's a small amount, but yeah, a little bit of And little bit of took her that blood. long to come in. She's, That's blood, she's hoping it's blood on her really, pillow. It's a really long trip. I know that, I know, and right? there are very few doctors in that area. Yeah. I, I appreciate that, too. But Cusco has doctors. Cusco mm -hmm. has doctors. Yeah, they have Daniel. No, 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 that was Lima. <laughs> I know. They could have Daniel. Cusco's right. a big city. Let's do this. Very good. Thank you, Daniel. We have a couple of emails. Nice. Amazing. Amazing. Really? First one is from Suzanne. Who writes, Dear professors, a few months ago, I finally listened to TWIP after much encouragement from my grown son. <laughs> I'm hooked. I started from the beginning and just finished episode 41. However, I was curious about the new episodes, so I skipped ahead and heard and just listened to the last few. It was exciting to find out that the sixth edition, Parasitic Diseases, is online at my fingertips. The case studies presented by Dr. Griffin are thought-provoking. In the 1980s and early 1990s, I attended medical school and completed internal medicine training. Sadly, I witnessed many horrible infections that overwhelmed AIDS patients. So hearing this case in TWIP 120, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this should have been in the guesses. Should have, <laughs> it's like she's guessing. Well, it's okay that you're reading it now. So this Brought is... back memories. My first differential included cryptosporidium parvum, giardia, lamblia, and entamoeba histolytica. The poor man seemed very ill and had a very low T-cell count. I'm surprised that his diarrhea wasn't bloody. I think that he most likely had amoebic dysentery with entamoeba. It can cause a severe diarrhea and abdominal pain. Plus, the rectal mass was not a cancer, but it was an amoeboma. Hmm. He had direct spread to the perianal area and had cutaneous amoebiasis. I bet you saw cysts or trophozoites in his stool or in that fungating mass. Hope the poor man survived. Well, this is the only wrong one, right? <laughs> It was an interesting story. It, it's an interesting thing. And I've actually seen that where you end up yeah. with this mass, the ame amoeboma. So. Uh, last month, I completed my recertification boards, which we do every 10 years. Nice. It was an all-day test about internal medicine knowledge. Out of all those questions, I believe there are only three parasite questions. <laughs> Two were about AIDS patients with diarrhea. Right. The other question stumped me. My brain froze. Uh-oh. The question started with a case study about a 30-year-old female who lives in America but went to visit her family in Korea. She stayed there for a few weeks. The case mentioned that she had eaten lots of raw fish oh, while visiting her family. When she was back in America, she had abdominal pain. Uh -huh. An ultrasound of her abdomen showed a large, thick-walled cyst in the liver. The question was, what parasite caused this? It was a multiple-choice question, and there were five different parasites to choose from. All I could think about was that Dr. De Pommier would be so disappointed <laughs> in me for not knowing no, the answer. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. Why did the history point out that she ate that raw fish in Korea? <laughs> Can liver flukes cause a thick-walled cyst? I thought they went to the bile duct. I knew that entamoeba could make a nasty cyst, but is it thick-walled? I struggled with that stupid question for so long that I confused myself. <laughs> Dr. De Pommier, can you tell me what parasites cause a thick-walled cyst oh, in the brother. liver? Please help oh, me put brother. this case at rest. <laughs> now I'm on the spot. <laughs> you think. Let me finish the email. Yeah, please, please. Thank you for presenting this material in such an entertaining way. It has helped me remember old information from medical school. Furthermore, I learned so many things about the world from your brilliant brains. Keep, Please keep doing what you are doing. The fall weather here in Idaho has been wonderful. Idaho. Idaho. Good place. I bet Daniel knows what 
with cysts. Yeah, I bet he knows. <laughs> no, I have to admit, I'm you know. Yeah, right. Let's I go always, through the list. I always I mean, hate. I always hate these questions. When yeah. <laughs> he doesn't well, like. He doesn't like case studies in reverse. <laughs> <In> reverse. No, <laughs> he likes the answers. He doesn't like the questions. <laughs> so anything with a thick wall in it and a and a, a fluke of, I think of paragonimus. I really do think of paragonimus. But the fact that it goes to the lip, no, that's right? okay. Paragonimus yeah. can go anywhere. It can go to the tip of your finger. It can go into your brain. It can go into any organ, and particularly in the lungs. Of course, it ends up in the lungs for the most part, but it doesn't have to always be there. So, it, it, number one, it could be paragonimus. Okay, mm-hmm. depends on how big the lesion is. Uh, number two, it could be a dead something. Yep, it went to the liver, started to grow, and then died. And that, and what you're seeing is a walling off process. That could be anything. Um, but the answer that they were looking for has to include the right answer, I would presume. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what would be yeah. what would be the appropriate so would level the, of knowledge. So, so they might think of um, fasciola, fasciola, but that's not going to give you a yeah. thick cyst, right? It's going to it's, migrate tracks right. through. Um, to pa- if conorcus? you think if you think about conorcus or opus thorcus, either way, they're not going to be in the liver, right? No, they'll be in the duct. They'll be in the duct, so you'll feel a, a right. you know a cyst, but it's not going to be Correct. in the liver. Now. Um, Echinococcus will cause a cyst in the liver, but nothing to do with fish. No, uh, nor walled off. It's not. Yeah. It's not <clears throat> thick. It's thin. That's why it's called hydatid. The, the amoeba. I don't really think of it as a thick wall, right? I mean, it's not really even a true no cyst. Or it's, an it's, abscess. it's an abscess. So you wouldn't necessarily get so a. Paragonimus thick... is my best guess. Yeah, I don't think it's a good question. She should, uh, you know. So what were the choices? <laughs> what were the choices? <laughs> she doesn't tell you what the choices. Okay, so yeah. if Paragonimus but, was on that list, I would have picked that one. It'd be, and that's consistent with fish, raw fish. It's yeah, sure, it's, and, and raw crustaceans. Okay. Yeah, even more raw crustaceans. Yeah, raw coke pot. So that, huh? that's the problem with them. Yeah, you put this together, it's not a. You, you know, have it, to be more specific as to what they actually. It may have just been a bad question. Yeah. So, so raw fish. I mean, raw fish. You know, that's those are all those uh, clonorcus type. Yeah. So, Suzanne, you books. write them back and say that we don't approve of the question. Exactly right. And the answer was <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Daniel, do you do recertification every ten years? I I do. I do. I recertify in internal medicine and infectious disease, and then I just took a tropical medicine certification, and I have a certification in travel medicine. I have to keep up. So, you know, it I'm always stops, taking it tests. It doesn't stop. And these are tests, right? These are tests. You sit there. It does not do you stop. study beforehand? I always study. I'm a, I'm a lifelong learner. Vincent. Yeah, he has not stopped studying since he <laughs> I never stopped. school. <laughs> Neither, I think all of us Thank goodness. keep learning, yeah, we right? Do. We yeah. do. We do. Here in academic. Not only do we keep learning, we are now educating in this, in this sense because we're, we're preparing other people now by going through the motions. Can you take that last email, please? I can't. My battery died. Your battery do you, died. Do you want me to just jump in? Battery save, died. Save the day. But listen, because I want you to answer this question. I will attempt Thank you. to. Go ahead, Daniel. Okay. And we are down to Nial writes. Yeah. Hi there. I'm a fly fisherman from Montana. You should let us know where in Montana. That's where my first job was. And you may remember several years ago when I asked to learn about whirling disease in yes. trout. Well, unfortunately, another parasitic disease has popped up in the state. Most of the Yellowstone River has been closed to recreation due to a massive whitefish die-off caused by proliferative kidney disease. Correct. It is apparently caused by tetracapsuloides brio salmonae, and more than 2,000 fish have been found dead. If you could tell us a little more about this parasite, that would be awesome. I wish I could. <laughs> Are you serious? Mixobolus cerebralis, cerebralis I could do because that's the whirling disease protozoan. This is a brand new entity, and I just uh, read about that about three weeks ago. <clears throat> and notice it said in the Yellowstone River, this is below Yellowstone Falls. This mm-hmm. is not the upper Yellowstone. This is the lower Yellowstone River as it goes past Livingston and then eventually out and joins up with the Missouri to form the big Missouri River, which then meets up with the Mississippi to form the big Missouri-Mississippi River. So whitefish, these are not trout. Mm-hmm. This river okay. is loaded with trout. This is a whitefish-specific infection. I don't see one trout dead from this thing. So whatever's going on is whitefish-specific. I've never heard of this organism before, but I presume because it's got two names, it's not a virus. No, it's a mixozoan parasite. Mixozoan, okay. Do you know what that is? Well, it's related to the uh, the mixobolus, the, the whirling disease protozoan. Okay. 
But in this case, it's not related to uh, hatcheries because they don't really have hatcheries for whitefish. Um, this is a, there are two kinds of whitefish in, in Montana, the ones that live in lakes and the ones that live in rivers. The ones that live in the lakes are delicious, and those are the ones that you get and you smoke them, and you're, they're very good. You find them in the delicatessens in New York. The whitefish that live in the rivers, <laughs> you try to eat one, it tastes like mud. I've tried it, and then they're just horrible tasting, mm. as opposed to the trout. And they both eat the same thing, by the way. They, they both eat the same food. I don't, I don't know what this organism is, and I don't know how it's transmitted, but if it's anything like Mixobolus, which is another microsporidium, then there's an intermediate host someplace. And for Mixobolus, it's a tube effect swarms. For this, it's a bryozoan. It's a bryozoan. What's that? It's even more weird. That's a whole phylum of life that's uh, below crustaceans. Mm -hmm. And if you look at these things, they're they're really odd in terms of their life cycles. Uh, They're still uh, animals, not plants. And uh, they are the intermediate host for this protozoan. That's, that's very yeah, it goes from this to fish and back. There's no fish-to-fish transmission. Mm-hmm. So, so that here. means that maybe trout are not eating this bryozoan, mm-hmm. but the whitefish are. Could be. So they would eat the bryozoan, right? Exactly yeah. right. So you can make little flies that resemble these bryozoans. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to catch white, you know what? Very Catching kidding. whitefish is not a big deal, and everybody knows about it because – when you trout fish and you're using something called a nymph rather than a dry fly on the top, you, you don't even know which fish hits the fly. And you, you pull and the fish starts to fight and you can immediately tell the difference. A trout starts to run and a whitefish starts to wiggle back and forth like this. Yeah. And immediately you know, ah, I've got another whitefish. The you know? fisherman. The fisherman. Yeah, we, we, I understand you're going to be um, interfaced with Trout Unlimited sometime soon. Tomorrow, Vincent, Thursday. Tomorrow. Thursday. Give them my very best. So what are you doing with Trout well, Unlimited? Neal, uh, at the end of Neal, writes, as a side note, Dr. Racaniel, it was an honor to meet you last time you were at RML. <laughs> Thanks for all that you do. RML is Rocky Mountain Laboratories in Hamilton, Montana. That's oh, where yes. Neal is from. Okay. Who I met the last visit, and I'm off tomorrow to the same place. That's fantastic. Oh, that is a beautiful Now. Place. It truly is. I got on the mailing list for a fish uh, thing, from, and I've been reading about this. <laughs> uh, Marshall Bloom, who's my host, right. is a fisherman, and uh, he said, uh, you should fishermen. get on this mailing list <laughs> right. because you might be interested in some of these diseases, and I read about this die-off. Okay. And uh, so that's why I know that Niall is from Hamilton because uh, yeah. Yeah, met, met yeah. me there. It's one of the prettiest spots on the planet. So Thursday totally. night is a meeting of the, what is it? Trout, to you, Trout Unlimited. Trout yeah. Unlimited. And there's a talk yep. by a lady about environmental DNA. She uses she gets DNA from streams to find out what's living in it. Hmm. Excellent. So she does said, a, a PCR on the river. Yeah. <laughs> he said, You'll you would like this. Why don't you come? I said, Okay, well, I had nothing else to do Thursday You'll night in it. Hamilton. You can tell him about yeah. the website, the Living River. You can tell him about that. Yeah, well, he loves it. I'm glad. And he passed it on to Baltimore, who Excellent. loves it. That's great. And it's circulating among all those people. Wonderful. So there you go. I'm, I'm it's a very nice that. website. Well, um, it's, it's uh, beautifully done because of your Yeah, it's, just, it's easy to do. It's no big deal. Yeah, well, for you. It just takes time, which is very costly, as you know. <laughs> That's TWIP 121. We're marching towards 200. We are. I don't know. Maybe we should do number 200 from a trout stream. I would love that. That'd be, be warm, though. Um, <laughs> by the time we're ready to do it, it should be right. Just if about right If we do time. two a month, that's how many a year? A hundred uh, a year? No, yeah, that's not enough. Yeah, we can next. We're year. almost there. We'll be there in less than a year. Less than you a year. Maybe around tw- August or September. 40, 40 weeks. We could, yeah. we could do it. We can do we this. Can, you can find all the TWIPs at iTunes and also at microbe.tv slash TWIP. And consider patronizing us, not being nasty to us, but <laughs> supporting us. Paternalist. No, no, no. You know, become a patron of TWIP. That's right. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Right. And there you can use Patreon. You could give, you could subscribe for a buck a month. A buck or you, a month. Or you could give some money by PayPal or credit card. Or you could go to our store and buy stuff. Or you could go to Amazon and buy stuff. And right. we get a little percentage of that. Any of these ways would help. So please check it out. It's not very expensive, and uh, it helps us to do things like travel. We could go somewhere. I want to get some help in production and so forth. Yeah. And do send your questions and comments, please, especially the case guesses, of course. TWIP, T-W-I-P at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is here at Columbia University Medical Center. You can also find him at parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. 
Oh, thank you, as always. Someday we have to change the name of this because it's not CUMC, but if you go to the website, it's still CUMC, so I'll wait till they change it. Dixon de Pommier, speak into the microphone, please. Get near. Okay, I, thank I you. Will, don't worry. You were far away. I, I was waiting for you to finish your introduction. Dixon de Pommier <laughs> is at trichinella.org and also at parasiteswithoutborders.com yeah. and also at the Living River. Indeed. Is that a .com or a .org? It's a .org, I believe. Is it .org? I think it's a .org. You got anything else up your sleeve? Uh, MedicalEcology.org. Okay, but no new ones, right? No. All right, thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. It was a lot of fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at Virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work or his oeuvre at RonaldJenkins.com. I want to thank our sponsor for today's episode, Curiosity Stream. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.